Sit back, close your eyes, relax, and listen to this story. When I was ten, my father, older sister, and I went to Walmart. My sister and I liked to wander alone in stores, so my father had invested in free walkie-talkies. I was by myself, walking through the bedding section, because I was getting a new bedspread. I was looking intently at one, when I felt that I was being watched. I looked over to the beginning of the aisle, and a large man in overalls and dirty brown hair was just looking at me. I decided to walk the other direction, and speed walk to the pet section, asking my father through the walkie-talkie where he was. He didn't answer. I made it to the dog food and was happily next to another shopper when he walked by the aisle. Thinking he didn't see me, I let out a sigh of relief. I asked my father again where he was, and again, no answer. I felt like things were safe when I turned around and this man was at the end of the aisle, standing there. I quickly walked away, with the plan to head to the customer service desk to ask them to call my father. As I walked, parallel to me, this man was matching my steps, keeping me from reaching the front of the store. I changed directions, trying to lose him. In my ten-year-old mind, I thought running to the bathroom would be safe. I ran in and hid in a stall. I heard his footsteps as he entered and saw his shoes below the stall's door. Then I heard an angry woman's voice say, Hey, get out of here, pervert. The woman knocked on the stall's door and asked, Are you okay? I opened it and hugged her and started crying. I told her everything and she walked with me, holding my hand to the customer service desk. She waited with me until my father showed up. I told him what happened, and despite the lady verifying it, he didn't believe me. One of my biggest fears is someone breaking into my house when I am at home. This fear has involved many sleepless nights, anxiety, and panic attacks. It has taken me a long time to overcome this fear. This fear started when I was eight years old. My childhood bedroom was the first bedroom you came to when you got to the top of the stairs. The stairs also had one really creaky step. I had gone to bed, like any other night. My parents had also gone to bed, and everyone was asleep. This particular night, I was awoken by the creaky step. I thought it was one of my parents going downstairs. Being eight, and very nosy, I got out of bed straight away, to see what they were doing. I got to my bedroom door, and peered down the stairs, to be greeted by two figures, halfway up the stairs. Thinking it was both of my parents, I put the landing light on, which was beside my bedroom door, to see what they were doing. When the light came on, I was staring at two strangers, a man and a woman, both ill-looking. Sunken faces and dirty. The woman was carrying a golf club, and the man had a crowbar. As soon as the light came on, and my eyes met the woman's eye, she let out a quiet chuckle and put her finger to her mouth, motioning for me to be quiet. Both of them turned around and left the house. Once it all sunk in, 
I ran into my parents' room to wake them. They had taken a few electronic things and some money, but my fears started because in my mind they were coming up the stairs with weapons. They were caught and given a 12 month suspended sentence. That was almost 20 years ago. This fear has always been a part of my life, but as I got older, I had to learn to deal with it. However, as of Monday night, this fear has come flooding back. I live on my own and had decided to watch a film downstairs. I must have fallen asleep. As I woke, the film had finished and the TV had gone to standby. Too lazy to go upstairs to bed, I decided just to sleep on the settee. I had left the curtains of my living room open and could not be bothered to shut them. Around 3am, I am woken up by shouting in my front garden and my outside light coming on. This was followed by my next door neighbour pushing a man against my living room window. My neighbour shouting, stay inside, stay inside, call the police. I did this, and about 10 minutes later, the police turn up and arrest the man that was pushed into my window. My neighbour explained that he heard two men talking outside our houses, and what sounded like my garden gate opening. When he looked out of his bedroom window, he saw one man with his face pressed against my living room window, trying to get a look and another man standing at the front door. Instead of ringing the police, my neighbour decided to confront them. He managed to get hold of the one at the window. They ended up having a bit of a scuffle before my neighbour slammed him on the window and had managed to restrain him. The man at the door had ran when he saw my neighbour grab his friend. Wedged in between the plastics of my front door, was a screwdriver. Not sure if he was trying to pop the lock or snap the plastics to get in. I am forever grateful for my next door neighbour. The police told me that the man they had arrested had only been released from prison the following week for burglary and an attempted rape. So thanks to the men for renewing my fears and any burglars out there Let's not meet again. In 2007, I went on a date with a guy from Craigslist. I was 17 years old at the time. I put an ad up looking to meet someone. I don't remember the details. A guy responded who lived close to me, and so I emailed him back and gave him my number. He was actually one of the only ones who responded without a creepy message. He said his name was John and he was 26 years old. This guy, John and I, spoke for two days before meeting and we met on a Friday night. We texted back and forth and he asked if I was single. I said yes. He asked what kind of food I liked to eat, because he wanted to take me to a restaurant. I asked him a few questions about himself. He told me he still lived with his mother, but had the top floor to himself, and that he was a part-time model that made good money. Judging by his picture, him being a model was fairly believable. So, on Friday night, John comes to pick me up. He drove a silver two-door car. I want to say Ford. He popped me a message to say he was waiting outside, and after checking my hair and makeup one last time, I said goodbye to my parents, telling them I was heading out with friends, and left. I got into John's car, and the first thing I noticed was that he looked exactly like his photo. The tall, 
dark and handsome type. He had pale skin with dark hair and dark eyes. He looked a little older in person, but he made up for it with a snappy fashion sense. He looked cool and cute. He was incredibly kind, and his body language and smile totally put me at ease. Yes, it's really stupid to go on a date from Craigslist, but surprisingly, this guy was normal. We chatted for a while as he started driving away from my hometown towards the highway. He wanted to drive us into the city to go to dinner, which wasn't too far, around a 25 minute journey. John started to reveal more details about himself to me on this journey. He told me he was embarrassed to tell me he lived with his mother, that I might think bad of him for not having his own place at his age. John got closer and closer to the highway, and I can't tell you what it was. I won't make it up because I don't remember, but it wasn't anything remotely creepy. I just felt put off by him. You know where you're on a date with someone, and you're not sure, and then they tell you something that's your biggest turn off? It was kind of that situation. Again, he didn't say anything too creepy, just off-putting. As we're getting closer and closer to the turn off, I tell this perfectly nice guy, I'm really sorry, I don't feel like going to dinner anymore. I'm not feeling well. John's initial reaction was sympathy. What's wrong? Are you okay? Is it my driving? I told him I just didn't feel well. John then kept asking me. What did I say? What did I do? I told him it's not him. It's me. I wanted to go home because I felt ill. Then he said, Okay, let me just drive around for a little bit, before I take you back. I don't want to end the evening like this. I knew that without him driving me home, I'd have to walk over an hour, maybe more. So I told him that driving for a bit sounded like a fine idea. But, instead of him turning around and going back towards mine, he veered off and started heading to the town I knew he lived in. I should mention it was pitch black out, and the town where John lived was surrounded by dense wood. This isn't even worth mentioning if you take the highway and proper turnoffs to get there, but he decided he wanted to go via the back roads because it's more scenic despite the fact I couldn't see a thing. John had gone from being incredibly talkative to almost completely silent. He kept driving further into the wooded area. A few times I'd ask him questions about himself to break the awkward silence. At one point, I put my hand on his knee, affectionately trying to regain the friendly, flirty banter we'd had earlier. He blanked me for the most part, occasionally answering in soft grunts or nods. It was like he was having a tantrum. John pulled into the parking lot for the forest. It was around 9pm, so naturally it was totally empty. He slowly kept driving, looking around for other cars and then parked himself upright at the end, close to the woods. There was nobody else in the parking lot, and I hadn't even seen us pass other cars to get there. For ten minutes, he just sat there, staring into the darkness ahead, which was disturbing. I think I managed to make small talk for maybe five minutes, which is a long time when someone isn't talking back. Then, I joined him in his silence. I was afraid of appearing fake. I didn't want him to think I was scared. So, some time of silence goes past, and abruptly, John gets out of the car, closes the door, 
and locks the car. I was stuck inside. His lights were on, so I could sort of see ahead. In front of the car was a field that maybe went on for about 20 feet, so really a patch of grass. And then beyond that were trees and dense forest. To the left was the rest of the car park, and exit at the far end to the immediate right was more forest with a small path. John disappeared into the forest ahead. I tried the handle on the door. Wouldn't open. I began to rationalise this. Maybe he accidentally locked the door. I was telling myself if he really wanted to do something, he'd have stayed in the car. With no sight of John, I decided I needed to call someone. I looked around for my phone and I couldn't find it. This was an old, silver, pay-as-you-go flip phone. I was confused that I couldn't find it, because I had put it right next to me, in the cup holder. After looking for it for a good few minutes, I became sure he had taken it. Mind you, I didn't want to start rooting around his car, knowing he might be watching me. I didn't want him to catch on, that I was freaking out. At that point, I started looking for my phone with only my eyes, instead of making it obvious. I was petrified this guy was watching me panic in the darkness. My eyes were darting all around the floor. Nothing. I looked up and squinted into the field and forest ahead. I saw him. John was standing about ten feet from the car, on that small field. He was standing and smiling. It wasn't a friendly smile. He looked freaky. This was not the same guy I got in the car with. I looked ahead and smiled back. I was still trying to act like his behaviour was normal like nothing he was doing was scary. Still smiling, his tongue began to protrude from his mouth. He stuck it out all the way. He began wagging his tongue up and down, while maintaining eye contact with me. I felt myself trembling. I was trying to compose myself, not taking his eyes off of me, and with his tongue still out, he started unzipping his pants. He took out his dick and proceeded to urinate in front of me while staring the whole time. This is the point I found it difficult to act like I was in on his behaviour. I looked down at the floor, not wanting to watch what was in front of me. He didn't creep or slink back to the car. Instead, I hear his thundering footsteps and then a slam against the window. I guess at this point I was the luckiest person alive, because another car pulled into the parking lot. I don't know what this did to John, but immediately he got back into the car and laughed at me. That normal laugh, and said, So what music do you like? I'll put it on while I drive you home. And he did. He drove me all the way home. When we pulled up to my house, I went for the door, but it was still locked. I want you to promise me something. I asked him what it was. If you see me, if you ever see me after this, turn the other way. Act like you don't know me. If you see me with my family, don't you dare say a word. I don't expect to bump into you, but don't say anything. I agreed. I then asked him, have you seen my phone? He told me no. I guess my phone was a small sacrifice for surprisingly making it home okay. When I got in, I said goodnight to my parents and went upstairs to my room and turned on my computer. 
I wanted to gather as much information about the guy as I could. Back then, I used MSN Messenger. It logged in automatically whenever I started up my PC. Now, before I get to the final part of this story, it's important you know this. One day, before I had been at my best friend's house, we had the kind of friendship where it was like, who could pick on the other the most? It was all good fun, and we mostly just ripped the shit out of each other and had a laugh. The day before she had changed two contacts in my phone, an old prank, replaced the contact mum with a guy I had been sending sexual texts back and forth with. I immediately knew she had done this because I saw the previous messages come up, but I didn't change the numbers back at the time, thinking I'd do it later. So, when I logged onto MSN, I had a ton of messages from this guy, and a few from my best friend. When John had locked me in the car, he had taken my phone and texted mum, telling her that, I'm sorry, but I decided to move out. I've met someone. Please don't look for me. I am happy being left alone. So, another thing about that message was it was all written in text speak, and this guy knew I never texted like that. Aside from the message itself, this was a big red flag. He had texted me back before texting again, saying, I don't think this is you. I know where you went, calling the police. This was incredibly quick thinking, as he had absolutely no idea where I was. I think that text saved my life that night, and it explains John's sudden change of behaviour. If it wasn't the random car, it was the text. Afterwards, we tried to find this guy online by name and by email, but couldn't find anything. It seemed everything on him was fake. My best friend pressed me to call the police, but I never did, because I feared the retribution I'd get from my parents for going on a date with a guy I didn't know. My friend ended up betraying my trust, and telling my mum anyway who still didn't call the police, but instead did what I expected and banned me from my PC and going out, while also calling me an idiot. There is something else too. Turns out this guy's first name was John, and he did in fact live in the town he said he did. Around three years later, I started going out with a guy from that very town, called Chris. We were talking about exes, and one day I told him about my creepy encounter. I didn't even get halfway through the story before he stopped me and started asking questions about what John looked like, how old he looked, how old he said he was, etc. Turns out, he knew him. This guy was now in prison for attacking and raping a 14 year old girl and beating her bloody in a nearby park. She survived without long term injury. That was just what he was in prison for though. My friend told me he was well known for being a creep way before that and his friends even called him Creepy John. He would go around the nearby parks where he knew the younger girls hung out, and he would ask them to get in his car, or take their photo. He would also tell them he was a model, too. My boyfriend at the time first met him when he was 12, because John decided to take up skateboarding and tried to make friends with lots of the young boys in the skate park. He couldn't believe I'd actually got in a car with him. That's my story about possibly, maybe, nearly being murdered, raped, or beaten. I hope you enjoyed. If anyone's wondering, 
yes, the guy is still in prison today.